So settling and grounding yourself. And we do the foundation of all good qualities to get the Lam Rim ever more clear in our minds. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to them is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon them with great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is greatly meaningful and is difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly day and night takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teachings is keeping the Pradamoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so of all mother migratory beings. Please bless me to see this, train in supreme bodhicitta, and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I don't practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects, and correctly analyze the meaning of reality. Please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping pure vows in Samaya. As I have become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledges like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the gurus who show the noble path and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus. May I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the stages and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajadhara. And so allowing that prayer to become an aspiration, particularly those points that resonate with you, So we've been talking about impermanence and death, and um, then you did the meditation on the eight stages that many of you have done before. I think all of you have done before quite a few times. The, there is many reasons why we do the eight stages of death meditation. What are some of the reasons that we do the eight stages of death meditation? To understand how precious uh, our life here is and to practice uh, our uh, involvement into uh, Buddhahood. 
That's hundred percent true in general and a hundred percent true for the nine point death meditation. You know, death is certain. The time of death is uncertain at the time of death. Only your practice helps that one. But the eight stages is that, but with a particular emphasis and, you know, kind of particular reasons for going through the actual process. What's the point of rehearsing your own death? We know why it's important to remember that you're going to die. So you make life meaningful, but why rehearse it? So we won't be afraid when it comes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's one big piece. Won't be afraid. Another piece. That's a big one to not be afraid and to not be shocked when you see these things happen for your loved ones, if you're with someone. Um, what's the other reason? Happy reason. So we can do it uh, right when it comes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we can use it. We can use that huge relief of not being distracted by our senses. You know, most of the time when we're meditating, our biggest battle is trying not to be distracted by our senses. Either the coarse senses actually literally wanting to eat, wanting to look at things, wanting to feel comfortable, or even more subtler versions wanting to be entertained by our senses, or remembering past moments of being entertained, or anticipating new moments of entertainment, generally our senses are one of us, our biggest distractions. At the time of death, that's not going to be a battle. They're actually going to dissolve, and our most fundamental mind is going to become manifest. So the power of whatever meditation we're able to do so far in our life is going to be a million times more at death if we remember, you know, because the mind's not going to be so distracted. And also you won't have pain. So this like rehearsal is to kind of key you into remember refuge, remember your motivation, remember refuge, remember your motivation, remember refuge, remember your motivation particularly at the beginning, as your death is launched, but all the way through if you can. And so, you know, we want another human rebirth to continue our spiritual path. If we die with a positive, peaceful mind, and then we forget everything else, that's okay. It's enough to ripen a positive seed for a positive rebirth. If we die with a positive mind and then catch the clear light, what can we do with the most fundamental mind when it becomes manifest? What's the big opportunity? We can be free of samsara. Because? True, because? Because we realize emptiness. Yeah. Yeah, because we realize emptiness directly, particularly the emptiness of the self and the emptiness of the mind. And this is much easier if you're having a naturally non-dual experience anyway. So you can have a kind of non-dual experience as you die, but not recognize it, you know? And so to train ourselves in recognizing it is really essential. So I thought we'd just go through them, you know, kind of briefly, see if there were any parts that you had questions about. And then if you want to, we can go more in depth either about Bardo experiences or the specifics of each stage, depending on your interest, really. Do you have more interest more about Bardo or more about kind of specific physiological cosmic things happening as you die? <laughs> we, we got one for the Bardo. Anybody? Bardo, I, I, Bardo? I would like to know your perspective or, or can you help me or us uh, with anything that, that is beneficial regardless of uh, reincarnation, model and uh, next, next. Okay, yeah. 
Okay, Bardo it is. I like good Bardo talk. <laughs> so we'll we'll do the eight stages. And then when we get to the Bardo, we'll talk about the Bardo. And, um, and I'll send you a handout with more elaborate stuff about each of the eight stages, just if you're curious. And then if you're not, then you're not. And it just lives on your hard drive and takes up space. So um, here we go. So this is the hybrid presentation. So this isn't in the LOMRIM specifically, but it's almost always talked about about this stage. And it's this LOMRIM sutra presentation with Mahayana Tantra hybrid. And this is very common to Tibetan Buddhism. So in Tibetan Buddhism, Tantra is such a big factor that the philosophy of it and the techniques of it find their way into a lot of sutra presentations, whether they're like explicitly signposted or made headings of, or it's just kind of quietly woven in, it's throughout the Lam Rim. But in the death stages, it's very specifically related to the tantric presentation and the tantric cosmology and the tantra idea of the physiological system. So anyway, just to know that as background, and also to know that if you're looking in your book, you're not going to find the eight stages of death in that particular place, because that's not a long rim specific topic, even though we talk about it here. So the verse we're up to, of course, is this life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. Here we're looking at after death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. So we're kind of in this transition point of, okay, when we die, we want to make sure we ripen white karma because it's going to follow us just like a shadow follows the body. Okay. So first thing is earth element within the body no longer supports consciousness and you have a heavy and a falling experience and a mirage-like vision. And so it's a little bit like if you are about to fall asleep and you kind of go <gasps> and you kind of catch yourself and it feels like you're falling or the falling dream. It can be like that for quite a bit of this stage or you just feel really heavy and it's hard to move your arms and legs. And so you'll see this with people if you're next to someone who's dying, where it's just a struggle for them to get a glass of water. Even though there's nothing particularly wrong with their limbs, maybe what's happening for them is cancer or a heart thing or something else. But now they're having trouble with their limbs as well. And that's related to the earth element, not supporting consciousness. So the earth element, <clears throat> the earth element, of course, is... Um, bone mostly, um, skin, nails, hair, all those things. And as they stop supporting consciousness, you see a mirage. Then the water element no longer supports consciousness. And you get like a smoke-like vision, like billowing smoke or steam. And you have a dry, unsettled experience. So your mouth is dry, your eyes are itchy, your nose is hurting, and you really are quite parched. So if you're with someone who's dying, you want to give moisture to their tongue, a little sponge, you want to give chapstick on their lips, and you know maybe eye drops if it seems reasonable or help them keep their eyes closed because it can be really uncomfortable. And you have kind of a unsettled experience like you're being swept away down a river. And some people feel more unsettled than others, but everybody seems to have this dryness. So the water within the body, of course, is urine, bile, blood, those kind of things. So then we have the fire element no longer supporting consciousness and a vision of sparks flying up or like fireflies and because the warmth in, within the body isn't supporting consciousness, you feel cold. And this is a key place where people get a bit agitated because they're cold. And they also don't like the weight of the blankets. So there's this kind of 
push and pull between give them blankets, take off the blankets, get them warm, but not feel too heavy. It's, it's a little bit delicate. So you just kind of want to be sensitive to the person you're with to see what they need. For us, it's important to not develop strong craving for warmth because that can kind of trigger hot hell karma, <laughs> you know, uh, hopefully it won't. Hopefully we're just like, gee, I wish I was warm, but I'm thinking of my spiritual path and I'm generally peaceful and it's just the body, oh well. That's the hope. So that's that disillusion. And then the air element no longer supports consciousness and you have a vision like a weak red blue flame about to go out. So it's kind of like the very center of the center of the center of the candle, that little shimmering red whiteness um, is what you see in your mind's eye. You feel breathless and your heartbeat slows. Um, wind energy is related to circulation and swallowing, not just coarse breathing. And then we have death or um, medical death where you have this like radiant white vision, like, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, like angels singing, you know, and this is when you actually die medically. And this is why people have the white light vision when they have near death experiences. So no breath, no heartbeat, no brain activity. Um, the mind itself begins to dissolve in the sense that coarser types cease and subtler ones become manifest. Conceptuality ceases, dissolving into a mind of white appearance. This subtler mind to which only like a vacuity or a spaciousness filled with white light appears is free from coarse conceptuality, but is still slightly dualistic. But you're not in pain. I'll just um, finish them and then I'll turn off the PowerPoint and, and we can talk about it because um, I can't see who is who. So um, when we get to the red appearance, the winds or the energy is gathering towards the central channel and the coarse minds give way to subtler minds, but still not the most subtle. Prior to this stage, our physical pain has ended. Here, our mental pain and worries of the past life are fading and they don't trouble us. Habitual urges and a slight dualistic appearance remains. So it's radiant red like a sunset and that fades to black. And the winds gather and the chakras start to kind of relax and you have a black vision and your coarse minds have finished dissolving. And the experience is like swooning unconscious or fainting. So you're not thinking about anything in particular, but hopefully you've had thoughts prior to that that will help launch you to recognizing the clear light, which is next. So in these three, the 80 natural conceptions dissolve sequentially and um, 33 are related to white appearance, 40 related to red appearance, seven related to black near attainment. And these are all just kind of different conceptions that we as human beings habitually have. They're the kind of coarser level ones, you know, like forgetfulness and things like that. You can read more about it if you're curious in Death, Intermediate State and Rebirth by Lati Rinpoche, but just interesting to know. So at this stage before the clear light, the subtle winds dissolve and absorb with the minds of white, red and black appearance. I'm not gonna talk about the channels in much detail cause it's a more tantric presentation but we can talk about it in general. The drops are another conversation which is really interesting in Tantra. So that's something to read more about if you already have an empowerment. But this basic visualization that you saw this morning with nine round breathing this is kind of the very simplified way of understanding the channels. And the channels are depicted as straight, but actually they wrap around the center channel. 
There are more than three channels. They pervade the whole body. And you can see here with the chakras that um, there's branches. So each, each kind of knot branches out and more channels flow from there. So this is very familiar to those of you that have done any kind of Eastern medicine. And, you know, just from a medicinal point of view, you know, we've got the right channel has more bile, the center is more wind, the left is more phlegm, a little bit more tendency towards anger, getting clogged in the right, attachment and desire in the center, ignorance in the left. These two are swapped sometimes. It depends on which presentation you're looking at. The arrangement in description has like a sutra medicine and a tantric practice variation, but the key elements are the same. And once all of the winds have gathered into the central channel and there's coming down into the heart chakra, the manifest fundamental mind is manifest and you have this clear light vision. So the subtlest level of mind is experienced. We try to recognize it and bring our understanding to it. So it arises whether we know what it is or not, whether we know that it's empty or not. The experience is naturally non-dual, naturally non-dual. So we use the inner appearance of autumn dawn, clear light vision, and marry it to your understanding that the mind and self are empty of inherent existence. So this bluest, lightest blue, that's the internal vision, like a cloudless autumn dawn. And then the bardo is established, consciousness leaves the body. When the karma ripens, rebirth is established, the visions reverse. The bardo being has a type of clairvoyance many dreamlike mental projections, both positive and negative. They remain up to 49 days. They take a mini death within the bardo every seven days. And when that karma ripens and rebirth is established, the visions reverse. So it goes clear light, black appearance, red appearance, white, weak flame, fire sparks, billowing smoke, mirage. So that was quick, but that's because you've heard it many times. You did a whole retreat on it. Um, before we do Bardo things, did you want to unpack anything about those or ask anything that you've been meaning to ask? No, just I, I try to notice the dualistic appearance of both. What do you mean? You say that sometimes it is and then it isn't. I can't quite hear you, I'm afraid. Can, can somebody repeat her question that's closer to the mic? She, she was asking about the dualistic appearances on the, on the way before the white light, clear light. Well, we have dualism all the way until the clear light, meaning like a sense of inherent subject and inherent object, right? That problem of projecting inherent existence that we always have we have during the death process, but it's sort of the edges soften or it's not so coarse, it's not so concrete. And with the white appearance, red increase, black near attainment, those 80 natural conceptions that gradually dissolve, they're symptoms of our dualism. And it's like they become less active, less problematic, and they don't agitate our mind as much. Gradually. So it's a great relief. <laughs> it's a great relief with those last three visions. Did that answer your question or did you have a different angle? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Just conceptually, what does it mean to die without the dual experience? to die without a dualistic experience? Um, well, at our level, it's to not believe our dualistic experience. We will still have a dualistic experience until we get to the clear light. At the clear light, naturally, that fades. 
but we need to recognize it. So there's a difference between it appearing a certain way and our belief in it. Just like in our daily life, things appear to be inherently existent and we're working on trying not to believe that. At death, that appearance of inherent existence fades and we train to recognize it. Does it make sense? Because then we can cut the root of samsara. I ask an empty course question. Yeah. Do they, do they know it because someone came back and uh, <laughs> talked about it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, um, great meditators can make this process happen while they're alive. You know, so they, they and we as baby tantric practitioners do this meditation every single day, sometimes several times a day as part of highest yoga tantra practice. And you find that the more you rehearse it, the more it becomes a catalyst for the actual experience of it. Sometimes as we fall asleep, you catch the mirage, you know, the shimmering in your mind's eye, the experience of falling. And then usually we lose mindfulness and don't catch the other visions. A great meditator, time slows down like it does for us in an emergency. Like if we were hit by a car, time sort of slows down, you know, that experience. And when time slows down because of your intense focus, it's not like literally it slows down, but the, you have more sense of time you're able to see more of what's happening with you. And the more you see it, the more you can gently control it. So I think through meditation, relatively quickly, you start to get an impression of these things, especially the first one. Great meditators go through in and out all the time. And it's, it's quite a important practice to start working with their inner energy system. But yes, many great meditators, um, you know, they've died and remembered and taken conscious rebirth, as opposed to us who just kind of go where karma takes us. Um, they're able to take a conscious rebirth. And so they're able to say first this, second this, third this. So these visions aren't visions that you create. They're visions that happen naturally because of a physiological process and a mental process. But for us, we have to pretend, we have to fabricate them to try and get us closer to things that we have actually already experienced, but we don't remember. I have a question. I'd like to know if we're assisting somebody, we're next to a dying person. Uh, is there anything we can do to help after stage number five, clinical death? Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, that's kind of the, the gray area, you know, where you don't want to move the body too abruptly because sometimes it can make the other stages happen very quickly and they leave the body more quickly than they would otherwise, which is not the end of the world if someone wasn't a practitioner anyway. But if they are a practitioner, don't touch them. Yeah, don't touch them, don't jolt them, leave the body alone and let them finish the rest of those stages and stay in the clear light as long as they're able to. And you know that Elvis has left the building <laughs> when a little drop of red liquid comes from the nostril or when there begins to be a smell or the warmth leaves. So, you know, what you can do is try and create a really sacred atmosphere of quiet. Um, the being isn't quite in that clairvoyant bardo being experience and they're not quite in their physical experience. So what they can hear is very variable at that fifth stage. It really depends because their ears don't work anymore and they're not out of the body yet with their clairvoyance. So what they hear and don't hear is really variable, but you wanna create an atmosphere where when they leave, they're leaving into a calm spiritual atmosphere because the bardo being is easily distracted and they're kind of battling their own projections like a dream. And you're trying to help them have a lucid dream or at least a positive dream. 
So if they're around your voice and they're around your mind, make your voice and your mind in alignment with things that would bring out the best in them. So you do prayers that they would like, you set aspirations that they would like, you talk to them as if they're, they're here and you thank them for what you've learned from them. You know, you remind them of good things they've done and just kind of have those conversations that you wouldn't mind them listening in on because they might be, because it's hard to know when they're exactly leaving. Some people leave quite quickly after medical death. Some people stay in the body for several days. So it's like you do your best, even though they might not hear you because it creates a good atmosphere. I don't know if that helps, but. Is there anything that you see or your orgasm, you have a little death? Death, uh, yeah, and when you fall asleep. It's the same stages or differently or? Yeah, yeah, exactly the same, just very quick. Just yeah. Why is it when you sneeze or when you have an orgasm, why is it? Uh, why does the what? <laughs> why is it happening? Uh, specifically when you sneeze and when you have an orgasm. And when you fall asleep, B because the winds are withdrawing into the central channel, right? That's, that's what is the catalyst, yeah, is, is the winds start to absorb. So there's a physiological relationship with your mental experience while you're in this body. So what is happening with this body has an impact on your mind and what's happening in your mind has an impact on your body. So if you're sneezing, your winds all kind of go, Foof, you know, and it triggers boom, 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 boom. And you go through all the stages and there's just a touch of non-conceptual, non-dual bliss at the end of a sneeze, isn't there? Just like a second, like a split, 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 split second. You know, it's like sneezes are uncomfortable, but like there's a part of a sneeze that's kind of nice. Yeah, that's your snapshot of the clear light, blissful non-dual mind. The non-dual mind is also very blissful. Yeah, when you fall into deep sleep, when you've hit the deep sleep, if you're semi-lucid, there's a blissful non-dual experience. Same with orgasm, same with all of those situations, right? So it's because of the subtle system going in and the channel knots at the chakras relaxing a little bit. And, you know, it's a complex process that um, you need a guru to help you orchestrate for yourself so that you don't hurt yourself playing with your chakras. Don't play with your chakras, please. Um, you know, people that do kundalini yoga are sort of playing with fire. They really need a good teacher or it can really make them a little crazy because your mind and your wind ride together. So if you kind of mess around with that system without good guidance, weird stuff happens. But it also happens naturally throughout a life many times. Is there something we can do at falling asleep that will help us to experience this subtle experiences more and more in a familiar way or yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Even, even if you're not a tantric practitioner, you can think, as I sleep, I'm dying. As I dream, I'm in the intermediate state. As I wake, it's rebirth. May I recognize the stages? May I see the clear light? And even if you don't, it, it plants the seeds of familiarity and it kind of creates the cause to recognize. And you'll find that if you sleep more intentionally, you'll have better lucid dreaming and your dreams won't be wasted time. You'll be doing Dharma practice while you are dreaming or at the very least not doing unethical things because you're aware of the dream while you're dreaming. And the more you have lucid dreams, the less confused you'll be by the bardo, the less you'll believe your own projections, the less you'll fall into a negative state. So, so definitely, yeah, within our life, every time we fall asleep, you know, dedicate the merit of the day and relax into, may I see this as my death? May I see the dreams as the bardo? May I wake as if rebirth? 
This is a very similar process. Good. Hmm. You hear me? Yeah. I, I hear you. You, you mentioned that the bubble is being created. Now you, you said something like this. The bubble is being created. So I understand bubble is being created individually for each person by some forces. Or it's I mean, you make your own bardo, right? You, 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 make, you make your own bardo. And the bardo you are ma making influenced by your karma or by what influences the, the bardo? The, the same things that influence your dreams. So your karma, your habits, what's been going on recently. You know, your bardo experience is very much like your dream experience. So your karmic predispositions, your current habits, what you've been thinking about and the things that have been happening to you recently, which is why when we die, we want to be really surrounded by positive beneficial things because that's the last things we were thinking about. So it will condition that dreamlike Bardo experience to bring out the best in us and also make it more likely for us to see it, recognize it, rather than just be in a foggy dreamlike thing where we believe everything tantalizing and everything frightening and generate all sorts of negative states of mind in the bardo so we want a good launch a good launch for our bardo so what, what does it mean it's a, an energetic situation or what a what situation energetic or what what is what is the position of the certain mind or whatever it is you know because it's you're not alive anymore okay so it's some energy that left your body already, yes? Yeah, it's your, your, your fundamental mind and the subtle wind that it rides on. Yeah, your fundamental mind, which carries your karmic seeds, which has been with you from beginningless time that goes from life to life, that fundamental consciousness and the very subtle mind that it rides on leave the body. Normally that subtle mind and the wind it rides on are just within the body but it exits. And so it has a purely mental experience and wherever the mind wants to go, it goes, you know, goes through walls, goes through whatever, cause it's not encumbered by physical obstructions. It can hear the thoughts of others. So, which is why it's important to think positively about people who have recently died for at least the first 49 days. And then if you've got your issues, go to therapy afterwards. But you know, give them forty nine days of before. kindness. Hmm? I thought to go before. Okay. Yes, exactly. Go before, and then pause, and then go after. Like this. Okay, so I was I was going to talk a little bit more about the Bardo. Um, I don't know if we have time before I'm going to meet with a few of you, but I'm just going to really briefly. I want to share with you this um, section from Chugim Trumpa. It's really. Um, really important and really beautiful. Um, let's just see, I'm gonna have to skim through. So the first Bardo experience is the experience of uncertainty about whether one is actually going to die in the sense of losing contact with the solid world or whether one could go on living. This uncertainty is not seen in terms of leaving the body, but purely in terms of losing one's ground, the possibility of stepping out from the real world into the quote, unreal world. We could say that the real world is that which we experience pleasure and pain, good and bad. There is some active intelligence which provides the criteria of things as they are, a basic dualistic notion. But if we are completely in touch, with these dualistic feelings. That absolute experience of duality itself is the experience of non-duality. So that's the interesting part, right? <clears throat> that if we are completely in touch with these dualistic feelings, that absolute experience of duality is itself the experience of non-duality. This is a really interesting point that he's making. Like if you fully lean into 
the thing that you're experiencing, you're recognizing the appearance of inherent existence. You see the sense of subject and object, fully knowing it for what it is, it kind of relaxes into an experience of non-duality. So here it says, conflict arises because duality is not seen as it is at all. It is seen in only a biased way, a very clumsy way. In fact, we do not perceive anything properly and we begin to wonder whether things such as myself and projections really exist. So when we talk about the dualistic world as confusion, that confusion is not the complete dualistic world, but only half-hearted. And this causes tremendous dissatisfaction and uncertainty. It builds up to the point of fear of becoming insane, to the point where there are possibilities of leaving the world of duality and going into a sort of woolly, fuzzy emptiness, which is the world of the dead, the graveyard that exists in a mist of fog. So this is what can happen. It goes on to talk about those experiences of disillusion. So this is what can happen if we go into the bardo unmindful, is that instead of emptiness being luminous and clear and a foundation for us to recognize, it's a foggy haze of confusion where we might lose our thread of sanity and believe all of our projections. So the training in the life is to notice the bardos throughout the day, the gaps, the transitions, and to really not lose ourself and not lose our motivation because every time we fall into our projections, we reinforce the habit of duality and stay in the fog. So we're trying to really look at, and I encourage you to look at today, bardos, transitions, intermediate states, because when you're present in a session of something or other, you're much less likely to be in the fog. But it's those moments in between where we lose mindfulness and start to believe our own projections again. So anyway, just have a think. And um, I'll, uh, there's a meditation again on death, a different version, but another meditation on death that I want you guys to go do now. Bye, and Thank you. Bye, bye guys. Bye. bye.